uh, you may notice that the host is Shannon Haddock and our speaker is Randy Haddock. If many of you are my friends and Randy's friends, but if you didn't already know, he is my husband. Um, he started with the Cahaba River Society in 2000, no, 1991. Uh, I met him in what, 1993. Uh, and the most important part is we got married in 1995. I probably took my first trip on the lilies in 1993 and have been going ever since. And uh, until I had bad knees, that now I'm back again with new knees. So enough about me. I, I will tell you more about Dr. Randy Haddock. He started his undergraduate and graduate degrees in Missouri and uh, he did his graduate work in um, Columbia, right, Randy? You're muted right now, anyway. Um, and then he got his PhD at Cornell uh, studying bugs, entomology. And uh, he has traveled around doing different studies and further graduate studies and landed in Birmingham. Thank goodness for us. Um, started with the Cahaba River Society as their field director and just retired in November after 30 years. He has done um, countless trips on the river, countless trips with the lilies, and um, he's my favorite pro. So uh, welcome, Randy. Um, the outline of our program is such that we're gonna talk a little bit if you have just, uh, questions for Randy, uh, you can put them in the chat. And we are gonna show a, a chunk of the time is gonna be a, a pre-programmed uh, video that tells you a lot about the history, the science of the lilies. So um, that video was pre-recorded last year. So there might be some dates in there that you need to, to disregard. Go ahead. There is one date. Yeah, it mentions the Cahaba Lily Festival, which is an annual event down in West Blockton in Bibb County. Um, it's, a, it's a very charming, wonderful uh, festival. And uh, it just happened, what, May 15th was it? I think a couple of weeks ago. So we missed that opportunity, but um, if you get a chance, that's a wonderful time to check on the Cahaba, to Cahaba Lilies. It's also a chancy one because sometimes the weather cancels it, which it did this year. Um, anyway, uh, I've given you an intro to Randy and I've uh, broken the ice that, that we are married, but I'm gonna give him no slack. You know, the hard questions, bring them to me and we will pose them to him. In the meantime, do you want to give us anything to start out with about the Cahaba lilies? Well, I, I just put in the chat that uh, I want to note that that festival was recorded and it's online at kahabalily.com. And um, you can see the proceedings of, the, of this year's festival there. So um, when I started going to the Kahaba Lily Festival, I would hear each year Dr. Larry Davenport, who is a, a biology teacher at Samford University. He is the undisputed uh, expert on the Cahaba lily. And as uh, Larry Davenport will say, Randy is his evil twin. <laughs> they do resemble each other. And uh, Randy and he have, have studied the Cahaba lily uh, together and apart, done, done all kind of their own individual science experiments and, and have really gotten a lot out of it, I think. Uh, Randy, you want to take over? Well, I guess from my point of view, what I got out of it was a job. So <laughs> and that job lasted for a good long while. So that was a, a, a pretty wonderful outcome for me. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, will you talk more about how your specific journey with the lily began? And uh, when you're ready to start the video, I will be too. Okay. Well, um, I uh, was doing a postdoc at UAB when I heard about the Cahaba River Society. 
And I started attending some of their meetings and realized that they were doing uh, trips on the river and began going along on some of those. And uh, on one of those, I heard, uh, I got to go on a lily trip. And that really sparked uh, my imagination because my master's work was on a prairie, tall grass prairie studying pollination biology. And at that point in time, there was still a bit of mystery attached to the pollinator for the Cahaba lily. So that's kind of what uh, sparked uh, a real lifelong interest in, in this beautiful plant. And I, I don't know, I don't know, I think I would be better off responding to questions. So uh, I'll suggest you go ahead and start the video. And All right, we're going to start the video. And like I said, at any time, if you've got questions, we will um, refer to them after the video. The, the video itself might spark some questions. So I'm going to start the video. And hmm. All right, Cahaba Lily fans, I uh, would like to make a little presentation today about the Cahaba Lilies. Here we go. Let me get that out of the way. So um, this will take about 35 minutes or so. Uh, the Cahaba Lilies have sort of become a symbol of the wonderful biodiversity that, and the biological richness that we find in the Cahaba River. So today I'd like to do a little description of their natural history. For me, the Cahaba lily presents an interesting dichotomy. Uh, the flower is this very delicate, even a very fragile thing, but the, the rest of the plant, the leaves and the bulbs and the other parts are, are very tough and resilient. And they live in a very challenging habitat that uh, very few other uh, vascular plants have managed. So as we go through the natural history of this uh, beautiful plant, I'd like you to keep those two qualities in the back of your mind uh, to under help you understand uh, this wonderful plant. Let me set the stage for this discussion with one of my favorite lily shoals. This is the shoal has been uh, named Lily Heaven by Dr. Larry Davenport, the Cahaba lily expert from Sanford University. So each year for the past 30 years, Dr. Davenport has been the keynote speaker for West Blockton's Lily Festival. And you may have an opportunity to hear him again this year on May 16th, but you'll need to check uh, kahabalily.com for instructions because the Lily Festival organizers have decided to make uh, this upcoming 2020 Lily Festival a virtual event. This is one of my uh, favorite uh, photos of Larry He's elbows deep in the lilies, contemplating and photographing and uh, collecting information about the lilies. He's rightfully recognized as the king of the lilies based on his uh, work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the interesting biological characteristics that he's brought to everyone's attention. So credit where it's due, uh, most of the information that we'll be sharing with you in this presentation uh, was worked out by Dr. Davenport. So for example, Hymenocallus, the, the, the Latin name for the Cahaba lily is Hymenocallus coronaria. And the Hymenocallus part means beautiful membrane, and the coronaria part means shape to the crown. And that's referring, that crown is referring to the central uh, feature here. Um, this group of uh, lilies that are found in this genus Hymenocallus are known as spider lilies. And that's because they have these sort of spidery looking uh, long and thin petals and sepals. Now we won't, we won't get too technical here because spider, there are six sepals and petals all together, but spiders have eight legs. I think they're talking more about the spindly nature <laughs> of the feature rather than its uh, enumeration, if you will. So um, the, the, the petals and the sepals are identical. And like many lilies, um, you see the uh, male part of the plant, the anther and the filament. So the yellow thing here is the anther and the, the, the long, thin uh, stalk that connects the anther is the filament. And in this case, the crown is made up 
by the filament flaring out and joining the filament of the adjacent uh, filament. So that crown is a, a, a feature of the male part of the plant. And here, this long, thin, green thing is the female part of the plant. So out here at the end, you have the sticky stigma that receives the pollen. And then this long, thin portion here is known as the style. And it runs all the way down to the ovaries down here. So the stigma, style, and ovaries are the female part of the plant. So uh, let's see, shall we go from there? Another typical lily feature or characteristic are the bulbs that this uh, plant makes. And here's a, a bulb that's not quite fully filled out. It'll get a little bit bigger. But those bulbs, like other lily bulbs, will grow and divide and, and split and make a, a, a pair of bulbs. And then those two will divide and you've got four bulbs. And before long, you've got a whole clump of lilies. And you see that emerging from the bulb are the strap-like uh, leaf blades. And uh, it's not apparent here, but uh, also the bulb will generate a flowering stalk or a flowering raceme. So here we've got uh, the flowering raceme that's topped by uh, all the flowers. One of the interesting things that Larry recognized early on was that the flowers basically only last for a single day. So uh, these are in fact very closely related to the day lilies. So in this case, you see an old flower here that was probably old maybe uh, three nights ago, two nights ago, the flower from last night, the flower that'll be fresh for tonight, and there's the bud that'll open maybe sometime today or tomorrow. That'll be the fl flower that's open for tomorrow night. And then the next night. And then kind of hidden behind, there's yet another bud that uh, fills out the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days of blooming that this flowering raceme will have a, an individual flower presented that night. So when the flower, if, it, uh, if the flower is visited by a pollinator, uh, it will go ahead and develop seeds. And here you can see a flower got a, must have gotten a pollinator visit because all three ovules of the ovary have filled out and generated a seed that oh, is easily an inch and a half in length and about an inch in diameter. So it makes a very large seed, which upon uh, maturation, the seed will fall off, fall into the river, and be uh, sink to the to the bottom of the stream bed. So now the the seed is kind of on its, it's on its own now, and you see that this seed has generated this dark this light green uh, vascular trace, and then the root system begins. Now the reason for this vascular trace is that it helps the roots find a little crevice in which the roots can become lodged. And then the, actually the vascular trace will contract and draw the, the bulk of the seed up close and hopefully close enough into the crevice so that the, the seed and the developing bulb, which we'll see in just a second, uh, will begin to wedge itself into that, that tight little space so it won't be washed away by the current. So here we can see some seeds that are the, that are sprouting their vascular trace or sprouting the uh, the leaf blade that'll come up here, some back in here that have sprouted. So hopefully those little seeds will get wedged into the crevices uh, between the, the rocks there. Now here's a, a, a clear image of the, the seed, the vascular trace, the developing bulb, and then from that bulb will come the root system and uh, the leaf blades that'll come up for that. So there you have that. Now, Hymenocallus, that genus, is a group of plants called spider lilies. And this is a, a different Hymenocallus, a different spider lily. This one's Hymenocallus occidentalis. And it differs from the uh, Cahaba lily, but it wasn't very clear until Larry started looking into this if uh, this was the same species or a different species. So when uh, Dr. Davenport began comparing the plants. He, he noticed several different things uh, that would uh, distinguish the uh, swamp lily, this Hymenocallus occidentalis, from the Cahaba lily, Hymenocallus coronaria. 
So for example, uh, in, a, in contrast to the kava lily, which basically presents a, an individual flower every night, the swamp lily will have several flowers going at once. And there are other differences in the width and length and the ratio of the leaf blade and uh, some other characteristics, some other morphological characteristics. He also compared the seeds of the swamp lily to the seeds, the very large seeds of the cahaba lily. So you can see cahaba lily seeds are generally larger, kind of oblong, whereas the uh, swamp lily seeds are just perfectly uh, spherical. Now, sometimes in science, if you're really, really lucky, you have an aha moment of discovery. And you, you see something that uh, you can only describe as elegant. And uh, as Larry Davenport was, uh, working on documenting the physical dis differences between the swamp lily and the kahaba lily, he had one of those aha moments. And what he, what he did that was so elegant was to gather up all the seeds and drop them into a beaker of water. And here you, here you see, as we, as we noted before, the seeds of the kahaba lily sink to the bottom. Well, of course, it would be pretty foolish for a kahaba lily to make a seed that would float because it would never be able to get itself wedged into the rocks. It, it pretty much has to sink in order to get down to where the rocks are. But the swamp lily, you see, all the seeds of the swamp lily float. Well, that doesn't make good sense until you understand what the habitat for the swamp lily is. And that is, it likes it in the riparian forest, way back up in the, into the woods. So when this plant drops its seeds, it's waiting for those seeds to catch a, maybe a spring flood event and that flood event will, as the waters rise, carry those seeds back up into the woods, exactly where they need to be in order to uh, uh, root and, and start growing a bulb and, and reproduce. So another kind of interesting and elegant experiment that Larry did was uh, he, he notes that uh, water is not a very good medium for carrying oxygen, but seed uh, germination and growth requires quite a lot of oxygen. So it's a, he was wondering how these seeds can have enough oxygen um, to, to be able to grow as fast as they do. So what he did was to take a couple of beakers and again divided up the seeds, he aerated one and uh, did not aerate the other and sure enough within just a few days you can see the difference in how much the vascular trace has grown for this group of aerated seeds compared to the seeds that were not aerated. So how does that then play out on the shoals? Because the shoals are actually a, a good spot for these seeds to try to germinate because the shoals are these rock ledges and as the water tumbles over those rock ledges they uh, become aerated and they help the, the god lily seeds to germinate and grow that way. So here's a shot of Hargrove Shoals, which um, is probably the largest single shoal or population of Cahaba lilies left on Earth. It's about a half a mile long from the top of the shoal to the bottom of the shoal. And you can see that the, the shoals run perpendicular to the length of the river. And you've got Cahaba lily bulbs and clumps uh, all the way across the river from one bank to the next for about a half a mile down the length of the river. So. Uh, that, that, that I haven't really explicitly mentioned that, but that's another kind of unique thing about these lilies is that they grow right out in the middle of the river, which is, you know, the active channel of the Cahaba. And that's a very uh, tough, difficult uh, spot for a plant to, to live and survive because the, the water comes up rapidly, it goes down rapidly, there's stuff washing down the river. And, um, so there are only a few things that have managed to do that. Uh, I'll point out here in the foreground is uh, the justicia or the water willow uh, and it has managed to figure out how to live in that situation and an, another plant which you can't see because it's an underwater plant that grows in the shoals that's really important to the ecology of the shoals is a river weed and it's a podostomum ceratophyllum and it's very important because the insects and bugs and snails just love living in the River weed. It's a, it's a wonderful habitat for them. The water willow, this emergent plant here, is really important because it's a 
just prime spawning habitat for a lot of different fishes. They like to lay their, they like to go just upstream of the water well and drop their eggs and let the eggs go back into the water well where they're you know, safe and protected. So generally speaking, when the cob lilies are blooming, the water levels are low and the flow is placid. And uh, this is kind of the scene that you have. It's a, just a beautiful setting uh, to go and enjoy and wade around in. But streams are not always uh, low and placid. Uh, in terms of flow, they're very dynamic. And unfortunately, on occasion, you can have a roaring flood occurring during the time the lilies are blooming. And that's what you have here. You see, at this point, the water level has not overtopped this clump, but it's about to overtop that clump and has no doubt overtopped some other clumps in here. Um, here we see where that's happened. The water level was higher and it's just completely pushed over the, the leaf blades and even the, the flowering stalks. Uh, these, these flowers are, are goners. They're not going to be able to set seed. And, Time will tell whether this one goes underwater and whether or not it'll have a, an opportunity for the water to recede and maybe the plant will just kind of uh, come back and uh, erect itself again. Here you can see the water levels are just dropping and uh, these, these plants have not had time to uh, recover very well and if the water is up for four or five days in a row they may not be able to. That's why you do see some variability uh, year to year in the number of flowers that you, you find. When, when uh, this kind of event has happened in the prior year, well, in that following year, there may not be as many uh, lilies blooming. So here we have a graph of the average uh, flow rate of the Cahaba River in Centerville, Alabama. There's about, a, I think, a 130 year long record of flow they, that they've documented. And uh, they've got an average for the month of January, February, and so forth. And you can see that in the winter and uh, early springtime months, that's when the Cahaba has its greatest flow. And then by uh, April, it starts to drop off. And by mid-May, when the lilies begin to bloom, right about mid-May, that the water level has dropped off dramatically. Now, you might wonder why they don't um, uh, wait until a little bit later. The, the flowering occurs in this little interval here between mid-May and mid-June. But the problem is that these plants have to set seed and those seeds have to grow and those seeds only have this interval in which to grow when the water levels are low but by uh, fall they will no longer have an opportunity to grow. And they have had to by that time saved up enough photosynthate so that the bulb can overwinter, the, the little seed is producing the leaves and, and roots and so forth, and they need time to, um, for the bulb, this enough photosynthate to survive all winter and the end of the early spring and to, to begin growing again. So they need as much time, the seeds need as much time as they can have in order to pull that part of the life history off. So here we have uh, some artwork by Guy Arello, and it sort of illustrates all the different salient features of the life history, that, that the flower is presented for a single night, and that uh, new flowers presented every night. The seeds are there on the end of the flowering racing. Those drop off into the water where they sprout and start to grow, and the uh, bulbs then become uh, divide and divide and wedge themselves into the rocks and the shoals of the river. He's got it all pretty nicely uh, laid out there. So again, that's Hargrove Shoals, and you can see it's a very nice, beautiful setting. Well, another topic that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service asked Larry to uh, document uh, was where, where do the lilies grow? And one of the things, one of the features that Larry figured out was that they seem to be concentrated on this geological feature known as the fall line. The fall line is sort of the demarcation between the hilly Appalachian highlands and the flatter coastal plain areas. Actually, the rivers are kind of steep as they come off the, the, the Appalachian highlands. And uh, there are a lot of shoals at that fall line. In fact, there are a number of fall line cities. You've got Tuscaloosa, Centerville, uh, Selma, 
uh, in, in uh, Auburn, I think, right in, right in here. But those are all fall line cities because the paddle wheelers could go up the river in the late winter and early spring, but that's as far as they could get. They couldn't get any further because this was this part of the rivers were, were too steep. So the cities, there were a number of cities formed along this fall line. And that's not just true simply in Alabama, that's true all along the eastern coast. There are fall line cities all along this. So Larry started looking at other rivers, and of course, we had, he, he'd gotten reports from others and knew that the Cahaba lily was growing in the Coosa River, in the Chattahoochee River. And it skips a couple of rivers for some reason, the uh, Okmulgee, um, and the, there's another one, let's see. I can't think of the name of the other one right now, but it skips a couple of rivers where it's not found. And then you begin to see it in the Savannah River system. And so the range, the east-west range is from the Catawba River in South Carolina now to the westernmost stream, the Cahaba. So the range is the Catawba to the Cahaba. Now it's in the Black Warrior, but it just turns out that the populations of lilies in the Black Warrior and the Locust Fork are east <laughs> of those populations in the, in the Cahaba. So the largest stand of Cahaba lilies that was ever documented were uh, located on the Black Warrior River near Tuscaloosa. This is a photograph that was uh, made by Alabama's uh, first uh, state botanist, Roland Harper. Uh, Dr. Harper is uh, another sort of fascination for Dr. Davenport. Uh, you know, Dr. Davenport's written about uh, Roland Harper. And he's a very colorful character. In 2004, a very happy thing happened. The uh, Cahaba River National Wildlife Refuge was established, and that's about 3,700 acres now, and it encompasses about three and a half miles of the main stem of the Cahaba, and you notice just a touch of the little Cahaba down here, and this is where the vast majority of the biggest populations of the Cahaba lily are located. Um, so, that uh, establishment of that refuge is something that we hope will help protect the Cahaba lily. Now, um, I, I covered a little bit about the biology of the uh, river, uh, of, of, the, of the individual flower, but Fish and Wildlife uh, explicitly asked Larry, you know, what is it that uh, pollinates the Cahaba lily? So when Larry looked at this flower, uh, being a botanist, he knows that flowers have several characteristics that lend themselves to being po pollinated by a particular group. So there are, for example, uh, flowers that when you look at them, they're long and trumpet shaped and orange and red. And those are typically pollinated by hummingbirds. They, those flowers typically kind of hang down and a, a hummingbird can fly up to them and poke its beak in there and get all uh, collect the nectar and get some pollen on the on its face to carry to the next flower. So the trumpet-shaped, drooping red-orange flower are very uh, commonly thought of as being hummingbird flowers. Uh, if you look at a sunflower, it's this big yellow disc with a brown uh, center, and those are typically pollinated by bees, and bumblebees, and honeybees, and uh, other native bees. They, they, they provide this nice big platform for the, the bee to hover over and then kind of plop down on and walk around on. Uh, another thing that a different kind of um, bee pollinated flower are the, the pea flowers, the irregularly shaped thing with a banner and wings. So a bumblebee will come up to a, like a mint or a pea flower and grab a hold of the wings and then he's, she's able to poke her head under the banner down into the throat of the flower. Uh, that irregular shaped flower is again something that um, is usually pollinated by some kind of hymenoptera. Uh, you, you could go, you carry this a little further in that there are flowers that are adapted to being pollinated by flies. For, for example, the skunk cabbage is a flower that's not very colorful, it's, it's basically just green, but it stinks like something rotting and that will definitely attract a fly. So 
uh, flies will get around and crawl around all over the skunk, the skunk flower and hopefully pick up pollen and then carry it to the next one. So when Larry looked at the Cahaba lily bloom, he asked himself, well, what does this look like it might be pollinated by? And so here you've got that big white disc in the center, and it's about two and a half, three inches across from anthers on one side to anthers on the other side. And you got the female part out here. So what it looks like, uh, he added one more uh, fact that uh, the flower doesn't really create a lot of aroma and smell wonderful until dusk in the early evening hours. So when you put all three, four of those factors together, Larry thought, aha, this is probably a flower that's pollinated at, in the nighttime hours. So what would have a wingspan that's about three inches across? You've got to have something with a long proboscis or, or beak or, or, or way to get way down here to where the nectar is. So these plants produce nectar to attract the pollinator, but they're way down here. So you need something with a proboscis that's easily two inches long or so, so it can make that reach. So he put all that together and thought, I bet it's a, Larry thought it was a, a sphinx moth. And sure enough, that's exactly what it turned out to be. This is the plebeian sphinx moth, and it's the first pollinator that we found uh, uh, actively pollinating the Cahaba lily. So we found this on a, a shoal in the Cahaba, and um, it was a lucky thing for me that we found that because I think when I wrote this little story up about the plebeian sphinx moths, it's probably something that uh, helped me get a job with the Cahaba, with the Cahaba River Society. So I want to thank Larry for uh, providing the idea that uh, secured my employment for the past 25 years. <laughs> so here's a, we, we revisited the, the, that shoal where the lilies are in, uh, in the nighttime hours a couple years ago and found yet another sphinx moth, very similar size and uh, has a very similar proboscis that is long enough to reach the nectar. And some biologists in uh, Georgia have pointed out that the pipeline swallowtail will visit the Cahaba lilies uh, in the daytime hours sometimes, but I think Larry provides a pretty convincing argument that these are really designed to be a nighttime pollinated uh, flower. Now, let me just kind of quickly go through some of the threats that we've uh, identified that might uh, tend to knock back the populations of Cahaba lilies to some degree. And let me just run through those. So this is a rocky gravel bar uh, that was populated by Cahaba lilies, but as time went on, uh, sediment started to settle out on this rocky bar and these bulbs and these plants didn't survive. So their bulbs were apparently smothered by the sediment load that dropped out on them and that population uh, waned away. So excessive sedimentation can happen in situations that uh, uh, keep the lily from surviving. Um, another probably pretty important thing are the, the locks and dams on some rivers. I mentioned before that uh, Roland Harper had described the uh, big shoal on squash shoals right above Tuscaloosa. I, I think I failed to mention that that shoal was about four miles long. So uh, in contrast to our a Hargrove shoal on the Cahaba, which is a half mile long. We've got a shoal that was almost an order of magnitude bigger on the Black Warrior, but unfortunately the Black Warrior was uh, dammed up and uh, locks were installed. And while the lily can tolerate being impounded or, or covered up with water for a day or two or three at a time, it cannot survive being uh, covered constantly the way the lock system did. So the wonderfully big population that was on squash holes was lost eventually. For a while, there was a considerable threat from people who were simply digging up the bulbs, carrying them away, and trying to sell them at the local Walmart or to other people. So there was some harvest uh, of the bulbs that uh, was occurring. And I've only heard of one or two folks who have been able to keep these bulbs alive in that situation. So uh, it, it's not something that's very successful. If you want 
a plant that looks like the kava lily that will grow in your garden. Um, there are nurseries around that have the swamp lily and they, they look very similar. They don't bloom at quite the same time, but the swamp lilies makes a good substitute uh, that uh, looks very much like the kava lily. So we encourage you to <laughs> go, uh, if you're gonna cultivate one in your yard, to go to the swamp lily, not the big up kava lily. One other kind of curious thing that Larry noted in South Carolina one time uh, with the Lockhart Dam, uh, the water levels dropped, the, the dam was kind of holding back the river there, the Catawba River, and uh, it allowed deer to walk out on the shoal and graze the, the leaf blades. So uh, the, the deer that we, <laughs> this is a charming little picture of a a doe and the lilies, but uh, what she's been up to is uh, chopping the lilies and uh, it's a bit of a hazard for the Cahaba lily. Now here we are back at uh, Lily Heaven on the Little Cahaba, and you see a nice uh, stand, a beautiful show of lilies, but you might note this plant in the foreground is not the same color as the other dark, deep dark uh, green plants. And the reason for that is that there, that clump has been subjected to an infestation of the convict caterpillar. So there's a convict caterpillar, convict because he wears black and white stripes. Uh, this is the larvae of a moth called the Spanish moth. It's a pretty little moth, not very big, but the Spanish moth lays its eggs on the Amaryllidaceae or lily uh, plants. And I think um, my opinion is that uh, they're, they're sort of misguided when they do that, although the eggs can hatch and the caterpillars can grow, these caterpillars need to uh, pupate in the soil. So when these drop off to pupate into the soil, well, they're dropping off, there's the pupa there. That has to be in the soil, but if this caterpillar drops off into the river, it's got no chance of being in the soil and it washes away. So that just may be misguided uh, overposition by the Spanish moth, I think. Another threat, and the one that I think is most significant, uh, is just my opinion at this point, but, and that is uh, trees and other big objects come washing down the river and they bang into the shoals and they can dislodge or, or hit the rock that's holding the clump of lilies into the river. They've gotta be wedged very tightly. And if you come and uh, whap on that rock really hard, it might dislodge the whole clump. And, on occasion, in fact, we have seen entire clumps of lilies that have been dislodged during a high water event, and that whole clump just floated away only to get hung up in the trees in that flood water downstream from there. And I think this is the last threat that I'll mention, and that's uh, this exotic plant. Here's a wild taro that uh, has grown all over the world. If you want to learn more about the tarot, we've got another video that you can <laughs> catch up on that. But the unfortunate thing about wild tarot is that it can completely smother and cover up the, the native plants that used to live there. And in this case, it can grow uh, out in midstream. You can see it gets to be a very large plant and it's just very dominant. So it can uh, overwhelm the other plants. Uh, it has runners that run down and baby plants start out on the end of that runner and those break off and wash down into the water willow. And you can see here under that, under that wild taro there, the water willow has simply uh, perished. So much of the shoal area is covered by water willow. And if this stuff gets out into all of into this area over here, it could, it can just cover everything up. And you can see that the, uh, water willow habitat and the Cahaba lily habitat are one and the same. So if it can smother out the water willow, there's the potential that it can smother out the lily. And we certainly don't want that to happen. And we've made a, a stronger commitment as we can <laughs> to keep the wild taro from growing in the Cahaba River National Wildlife Refuge. And really the best way to do that is to get it out of the river system. Uh, unfortunately, in the Coosa and the Black Warrior, there are places where the water willow has gotten so dense that it's unlikely that they're gonna be able to uh, eradicate uh, taro from those systems. So the Cahaba may be our last chance to keep a uh, population of lilies healthy in that regard. Now, just 
I'm going to touch briefly on some other plants that are unique to the Cahaba watershed. Uh, in 1992, uh, a different botanist, the one Jim Allison from the Georgia Natural Heritage Program, was uh, looking for um, a, a special kind of habitat known as a uh, Dolostone glades. And he knew from geological maps that uh, there were some Dolostone glades on the little Cahaba. So he went and floated down the little Cahaba until he got to one of those glades and got out. And before it was over, he had discovered eight plants that were new to science. So <laughs> here we have the Cahaba paintbrush, a Castilia species, the Cahaba tick seed, a Coreopsis species, the uh, Cahaba daisy fleabane, and the Cahaba uh, clover, that's it, the Cahaba prairie clover, a dahlia species. And uh, in addition to that, there's a prairie, the deceptive marble seed, the Cahaba torch, uh, the Alabama gentian pink root, that's a gentian plant there, and unique to those glades, and a great big old, about a five or six foot high sticky rosin weed. And uh, as I went through that list, you might note that uh, about half of those got named after the Cahaba River. And it's not just uh, those, there were other that in those glades had just a whole host of uh, rare and uh, in, in some cases imperiled uh, species. Uh, here's Moore's Barber's Buttons, one of my very favorite plants on earth, the, the Baptisia plants. Here's a Georgia aster, a federally uh, endangered plant. I believe the Georgia aster is a, a, an endangered species. And here's a plant that had not been seen <laughs> for a very long time. I think it was the 1860s since the last time this plant was seen. Uh, and this is the dwarf uh, horse nettle. Not a very tall plant, just four or five inches tall, but the, it had been described, was in the literature, but hadn't been seen for a very, very long time. So the lilies have kind of become uh, a symbol for the uh, biodiversity of the Cahaba River. And that, that biodiversity extends to other uh, areas. We've got a wonderful uh, diversity of fishes and turtles and mussels and snails and crayfish. and uh, Again, if you want a different little perspective on that, we can, we'll have a little video about the, that biodiversity of things that, that live in the Cahaba. I don't think I mentioned that, though, the uh, freshwater crayfish. We, we have some things living in freshwater that, I'm sorry, a freshwater shrimp. And that's a little shrimpy guy. He's only about two inches long. This is a female, and all those are eggs that she's carrying around with her to keep them well aerated. So a lot of really wonderful things living in the, in the river. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that uh, the Cahaba River is uh, very nice in terms of being able to pull up to a patch of lilies, park your boat, and get out and walk around. Uh, there are places, other places where the lilies are found, but it's a little bit harder to stop and get out and enjoy them firsthand the way you can on the Cahaba, Little Cahaba River. So if you ever get a chance to go with us, I hope you will, and uh, we can uh, let you have a first-hand experience with some kind. Well, thank you for your attention, and thank you for joining us. And uh, please join the Gaba River Society and uh, become a member if you're not. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. That is a great compilation video of just like everything you ever wanted to know. <laughs> we did have a few questions. Um, how it, do the lilies depend on separation and having individual bulbs or does that matter so much with the Cahaba lily as it does with regular lilies? Yeah, the reproduction is largely through that bulb division. We do see some seeds being produced, but when you have a big old clump of lilies, that clump probably got started from maybe just one seed that grew into a bulb and the bulb started dividing and dividing and dividing. And you, you will see, for example, 
uh, differences in the timing of the flowering between clumps. And that's probably a genetic difference that, that originated with different seeds. The, on a rare occasion, you'll see a clump where half the clump is flowering and the other half is not. And that's probably a situation where two seeds got started there and started growing and they were genetically different and one, one blooms earlier than the other. So, but that asexual bulb fission is very important for their uh, reproduction. Now there's several questions about the best time to see them. And I would say during the week when no one else is there. <laughs> and, um, and you might wanna speak to um, the, the the Cahaba River Society does recreational lily trips. And of course, for this span of time this year, they're all booked. So what are some alternatives to seeing the lilies um, if by boat or, or on individual person? Right. Well, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the, the folks that own the land around the Cahaba River National Wildlife Refuge have a web page. So if you Google US F&W Cahaba River Refuge, they have uh, directions on how to get there. And basically it's just five miles outside of the town of West Blockton. So you can go there. There's a road that runs about two miles along the length of the river. And uh, you start seeing lilies about a mile down that. And then the shoals get bigger and bigger the, uh, as you go that next mile down the river. Uh, you can walk out into them. Uh, you can throw a boat in and paddle out to them. Uh, water levels, uh, we, when we do trips, we vary how we do that trip based on water levels. And when the waters are low, like they typically are, uh, we paddle out to the lilies and then turn around and paddle back. Uh, there's another bridge downstream and you can if you want, if, if you wanna go for a hike while you're dragging a canoe, you, you can uh, paddle down to the next bridge. And, and uh, also I've got comments from photographers on what's your recommendations? Um, I, 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 I can't help you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. A tripod helps. Uh, but beyond that, I'm worthless in trying to help you out with that. I do want to mention, though, the question about when and where. Uh, the refuge is the best where. The when is sort of Mother's Day to Father's Day. However, what we've been noticing normally is that they're slightly advancing uh, as uh, time goes by, and they're coming a little earlier than they did 10 years ago. Uh, this year was a real exception, and they were late because uh, of the high water, the flooding that we had, and the slightly cooler temperatures seemed to put the timing back a little bit. But I think that was just something unusual. What is the protection on the Cahaba lily, if there is any? Well, uh, the determination was made that there are enough populations of lilies that it's not going to be listed as a threatened or endangered plant. Uh, once you get over about 50 different locations where something can be found, then Fish and Wildlife Service is reluctant to list it as an imperiled species. And uh, Larry has uh, accumulated, I think, 75 different locations where the lilies are found. Uh, the Conservation Department, the Alabama Department of Conservation folks, assert that the state of Alabama owns the bottom of the river. And it's a public resource and that they have enforcement uh, responsibilities and abilities. So if a conservation officer catches you, you're, you're going to get fined. Uh, City of West Blockton, and I believe Helena and maybe one, I'm sorry, I can't remember if I think there's one other town that has ordinances, uh, local ordinances to protect the lilies. So uh, I, I don't think they have people out checking, but uh, they, they do have uh, things on the books to try to protect the lilies. Well, just in the years we've been together, I, you know, that one of the threats you mentioned about the um, um, removing the bulbs and trying to sell them, you know, that, that, has, that seems to have declined because of 
talks like this, getting the word out that they're not going to grow in your garden, you know, that kind of thing. And, and as people learn that, they won't buy them and there won't be a demand and hopefully people won't be stealing them out of the river. Yeah. Uh, I did have a question from Putt that can you force a lily to grow in a particular spot? It's saying it's the same riverbed kind of setting. Well, I've not found anybody that's been very successful at that. There have been several people that we've talked to who have tried to raise Cahaba lilies uh, outside that natural environment. They just don't, they don't thrive for sure. They don't continue to grow in bulbs splitting and so forth. I, uh, I think John Mannion at the Botanical Gardens has given a, a try to grow some. Uh, you know, he's, <laughs> he's kind of an expert. He might be able to. Uh, but Wheezy Smith is the only other person I know. And she's got a stream in her backyard. So it really seems like the lilies need flowing water and a pretty open sunny canopy and uh, all, all those factors you just most people don't have in their yard so uh, they, they just don't do well the, the swamp lily does pretty well and we certainly think that uh, that would be a better alternative that's something that's grown commercially and sold commercially nurseries uh, will uh, have that available uh, yeah, um, uh, one person, uh, Zach, my nephew, uh, it mentioned uh, what are the benefits? I mean, besides being a gorgeous flower, what can you say as it, uh, for it and its habitat? Well, for things that live in a river, especially <laughs> the things that I love, like bugs and snails and things like that, <laughs> they need something to hang on to. And the clumps of lilies are good habitat for a lot of different macroinvertebrates. So the, the critters that are the base of the food chain and the food for a number of fishes and other things, they, they, they like the clumps of lilies and they do well, they grow well there. And uh, so in that regard, they're improving the habitat quality. And a lot of these bugs are actually helping to clean the river. They're, they're, harvesting food that's washing down the river. And uh, so uh, there's some water quality benefits that are possible there too. And I mentioned that river weed, the pedostomum uh, that grows underwater, it, it does that as well. So there, there are some uh, really important uh, benefits that these native plants have for the health of the river. Well, there's two more. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to bring up, you did mention the nighttime fragrance. And uh, I will say, being on so many trips with you, there's also a very strong taste. Well, not strong, but a very distinct taste. You can um, get, uh, what do you call them? Capillary. Your, yeah, your capillary tube and go, like, like you would a honeysuckle, bring the nectar out. You can actually taste a very distinct flavor uh, in the Cahaba lily, and, and that's part of what makes it so fragrant at night. Um, and then we have the very esoteric question about what do you think is the future 20, 30 years from now of how confident are you about the lily's existence? Well, um, my impression is that presently the greatest threat to the lilies is the hydrologic changes occurring in the river. Now, what I'm talking about there is that we have the city of Birmingham and other municipal areas in the headwaters. And as development progresses, as it proceeds, we increase the hard surfaces in the watershed. That is the roads, the, the rooftops, the parking lots. And what that is doing is making the river more flashy instead of soaking into the earth and getting hung up on the leaves of trees and so forth, the rain is very quickly directed right into a storm drain and placed in the river right away. And that causes the river to rise quickly. And then because you don't have good groundwater to allow that uh, groundwater to flow into the river slowly, it drops quickly. So this flashy up and down flow 
is causing really terrible erosion of the banks of the stream of the Cahaba. And that is causing a lot of trees and other things to wash, to, to erode and wash off into the river. And when those trees go floating down the river, they can, uh, as we described before, bash into the uh, shoals and dislodge the clumps. I, I fear that if we don't do a better job of managing stormwater, uh, then that, is, that attrition is going to increase and that lilies have not been able to keep up. Now, most of the cities in the upper watershed now have adopted some, some stormwater ordinances. Now, we're still kind of waiting to see whether or not those are going to be very effectively enforced and whether stormwater runoff issues are going to improve. And we've we actually yet to see much improvement, uh, although there's hope that there will be uh, with, with at least some of these municipalities. We need all of the municipalities to address that problem a little more vigorously than they than they than I would allow that they do. <laughs> Well, uh, I'd like to hear from Ashley DeCency. She she mentions nearly native nursery in Fayetteville, Georgia. Uh, they raise them and plant them along the rapid shoals along the Chattahoochee Whitewater Course. Now that would be a sight, wouldn't it? <laughs> Going down the Chattahoochee and, and seeing that, that bright white come through. That sounds gorgeous. Does anybody else want to unmute and ask any specific questions or comments? This is your time. And uh, yeah. Oh, wow. She says there's like, so far she's counted at least 20 in bloom this year in that those locations where they planted them. And yeah, Jennifer, climate change also promises more intense rains. Yeah, the, the flashy weather is 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 such a unknown factor. It well, no, it's not it's not unknown. I mean, that's that's the climatological forecast is that it, rivers are going to get more droughts and more floods. You know, some years it's going to be one or, or the other, and and that is going to contribute to that erosion problem and uh, that you know calls for better stormwater management than we're currently doing. That's fantastic to talk about because that could change. Uh, you know, you, we each year around Mother's Day, we start looking at the rain levels and how it's going to affect, you know, the opening times for the lilies to be viewed. Um, if no one else has any other questions, I do want to say, like I said at the beginning, um, there's a companion. Uh, program tomorrow night where you can come by the library and pick up a watercolor postcard kit and uh, join online and they're going to have a lesson um, there I will have all your names entered for door prizes and we'll announce those later in the week oh yes Ashley talk about the uh, the uh, restoration project if you could yeah sure um, yeah, so my name is Ashley DeCency, and um, I work for Chattahoochee Riverkeeper. So we're an environmental nonprofit that's based in Georgia. Um, but I have actually been uh, helping out with this restoration project with the shoal lilies. Um, I started as an undergrad, um, what, maybe five, six years ago, um, and heard about the lilies and heard they were doing this project to reestablish them along the whitewater course that's in Columbus. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys know about it. It's it's a pretty big um, course. Yeah, so they did all this work to kind of build this whitewater course. You have a lot of areas where the lilies were thought that maybe they do well. Um, so another local conservation group, uh, the Chattahoochee River Conservancy, actually partnered with Nearly Native Nursery. Um, it's a native plant nursery in Fayetteville, Georgia, to um, go out. They found a parent population on Flat Shoals Creek in Georgia and collect the seeds. They grow them up. It's really cool. They use some um, like ponds that they have that they aerate um, and they like tumble the seeds constantly um, until they germinate and then they pot them 
and they really baby them for, you know, a full growing season. And then we take the, the young uh, seedlings out and hand plant them. Um, and we put in probably 3000 and the last count, uh, there were 650 that were actively growing, some producing flowers. Uh, we had some set seed last year. So yeah, really exciting. Um, really said, is, yeah. Yes. So, anyway, I, I, uh, I wanted to mention that somebody is doing it successfully, but um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work that they put in, so. I'd like to point out though, that what you're, what you're doing is putting it back in its habitat. You're not trying to grow it on the side of the house. Yes. Or in your garden, <laughs> which that doesn't work very well. It but does getting not. it in a river where it belongs, that, that makes good sense. And I'm just thrilled that you're having good luck with that. Yeah, you guys come down anytime uh, during the growing season. Let, and let me ask, do, do you call them Cahaba lilies or do you call them something else? We don't. We call them the shoal spider lily. <laughs> you guys have the you guys have the privilege of, you know, you guys call them the Cahaba lilies, but um, I think the, the only common name that's been published in the literature is the Cahaba lily but uh, in other places that's not what everybody else calls them. <laughs> no we call them the shoal the shoal spider lily and then I've heard people talk about the Catawba lilies um, so I think it really just depends on where you are. Everybody wants to you know hold them <laughs> here so yeah. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. And um, I want to shout out to my sweet husband. This is 13 years in the making. I've been trying to talk the library into to letting me do this kind of program. And it just so happened that the uh, pandemic brought about virtual programming. And that is how this happened. So I am so thrilled to finally uh, showcase uh, Dr. Haddock's skills, and um, I know that I'm lucky, so we are very lucky to have access to this. Uh, the Cobb River Society is continuing to do recreational trips, even, you know, not during the lily season, so uh, keep tabs on that, and I hope to see you guys tomorrow night at the next promotion of the Cahaba lily. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.